sport management and marketing agencies, and sport marketing. So as we discuss the need for sport management and specifically marketing agencies, you often think of athletes, uh, professional athletes, who have agents and are looking for management in specific areas. And long-term goals are something that management companies really assist athletes with when their playing career is over. And you'll often find some of the higher paid athletes move on into other career fields. Um, you see career shifts at times. Sometimes they stay within their sport and become coaches, management, pieces, um, and even ownership uh, in their respective sport. But also when you're talking about the athlete and uh, management companies, um, sponsorships are a key to that as well. When athletes um, are in their playing career, in the midst of the height of their focus of their career, sponsorships are key. It's extra income for them. It supplements on top of their base salary, which sometimes can be even more than their uh, salary to play the sport. So sponsorships are huge. Events are coordinated as well, where um, an athlete or a company will host events which has a lot of revenue attached to it. And then also contract negotiation. And we'll get more into that as we talk a little bit more specifically on that. And that involves their employment contracts and also marketing contracts and any other contract to which an athlete or an entity will negotiate uh, with a company about revenue and trade, trade for services. And then they also help and assist with investments. And that also goes with their long-term goals in allowing an athlete to be able to provide for their future because once their playing career is over, it, it's sad to say, but an athlete would have a fixed income at a certain point in their career. But at the height of their career, when the money is coming in, what do they do with it? And a management company will help and assist with um, assets, investments, allocating funds, and if the athlete is, is smart, they listen to the advice that they're given. You often hear stories of athletes who really spend all of their money after their playing career is over and they're broke within five, six, seven, eight years. And it does ring true. I've seen it myself. Um, and it's a really sad situation when they've been given an opportunity to invest and to do it right and really to seek wise counsel uh, during the times when they have a heavy income coming in. So the overall arching idea here also is that companies who are management companies aren't necessarily just focusing on the athlete. Sport management companies really expand beyond the athlete. They represent corporate brands, properties, media companies, events, um, teams, franchises, universities, you name it. A marketing um, sorry, a sport management company can oversee all of those aspects of it. Where there's revenue and where there are funds within the world of sport, a sport management company can help and assist. As we look at the table here that's in your textbook, it's talking about the major functions of the sport management companies um, and the marketing agencies. What do they do? We talked about strategic planning, sponsorship and licensing, um, event creation and management, contract negotiation, marketing activation, which simply means when a company is looking to market the person or the brand, actually activating it and actually implementing uh, through the contract. And content development is actually building pieces out for an athlete or a company and financial planning and then research and evaluation. You'll see the categories here with talent, which means the athlete themselves, the property, which means the team or the entity, the franchise, the corporate brand, which can be the brand associated with the athlete, for instance, Michael Jordan and Nike, or the Air Jordan brand, and then a media company. Um, they can all be interrelated, and they can all have a function within the sport management company who's trying to uh, manage each piece of that. 
So keep in mind all those things are intertwined and or separate. A sport management company can do individually or can really uh, do all of those pieces, whatever the athlete or the company, the entity is looking to do. So contract negotiation really is a fine art between athlete and the ownership or franchise. And even beyond that, contract negotiation um, exists with companies, with branding, with different offshoots of something a company might want to do when it comes to events that have their brand on it. Um, even corporate signage at stadiums and arenas, those are all under contract. And that would be where a sport management company would come in and assist with that and help with the contract negotiation. And just as the term says, negotiation, that's exactly how it works. So when a company would come back, service for trade is something that you'll see in a contract. What will the company get in exchange for the name, the branding, the appearances of the athlete? There is a trade component there that is heavily looked on when it comes to the negotiation part. So uh, again, it's a fine art. A lot of companies have their best people doing the contract negotiations. Many sport management companies uh, have representation specifically for their athletes or contracts. And 99 out of 100 times, that person that is the agent or the personal uh, person to assist um, has a law degree. So player agents, a lot of folks will say, you know, I would like to be a player agent. I would like to be an agent within a sport management company. They do have law degrees because they do a lot of contract negotiation. So if you're interested in going down this field, keep that in mind. And then the next point here is what would be in the contract of a professional athlete? Uh, and examples of that would be, obviously, their pay scale is really the biggest piece of a negotiation. And it goes back and forth and is ranged on a lot of different aspects. So if an athlete is in um, the draft, is one of the top picks, top 10, obviously, it negotiates a higher pay scale. And some folks will ask, is there an existing scale for that? The answer is yes. All um, entities offer a scale, they have it, it's locked in, and then they range from there. And sometimes you'll see players jump off that scale, and that's depending on wiggle room with salary caps within a franchise, um, different uh, aspects that you're looking at when it comes to the athlete themselves. So there's also other... Um, Pieces within a contract of a professional athlete that revolve around a collective bargaining agreement that is associated with their player union. So that's a whole other discussion, um, and those are specific to each league, each different sport. And um, again, that's focusing on the professional athlete side. Um, there's a lot of different contract negotiations when it comes to arenas, signage, um, different uh, places where sport management companies would assist with events, uh, but specifically on the professional athlete side, if you dig into the contract piece, it gets quite interesting to see what's uh, in the contract. So take a peek and Google, try to find some of those, and you'll be surprised at what you see. <clears throat> Challenges facing um, agencies, uh, major challenges, it, major challenges are the client base. Um, you never know who's entering drafts, what type of athlete uh, is going to be represented by your specific company if you're the company seeking out athletes. How do athletes choose a management company? A lot of those uh, are predetermined, you can say. They are uh, referred in by other athletes who have used them. Word of mouth is certainly key. There are a few out there where word of mouth has really hurt them and damaged them. You'll um, take a look and if you do some Google searching on management companies that have kind of fallen apart, you'll take a peek at a few that have been um, around even in the Los Angeles area specifically with Athletes in the football world, 
there have been a couple that have unraveled and have really damaged them because athletes don't want to move in that direction with their company considering they've fallen apart. So uncertainty is really a big one. Um, outsourcing and finding other ways for them to get the management that they need. In other words, not necessarily going with one company to encompass everything, but outsourcing financials to a CPA, find, um, financing some other pieces, um, investing in a real estate agent to do the real estate investments and outsourcing and piecing things out. That does happen a lot of times. Conflicts of interest occur, uh, mergers and acquisitions are challenges. If things fall through the cracks, management company takes a hit on those. And labor unrest. I mentioned talking and working through the unions. And there have been protests. There have been blackouts for the NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball. All affect management companies and what they can do, what they can offer, and when it halts, it obviously hurts their business. Management companies make their profit, make their revenue off of signing athletes, managing them, managing their entities, and also with companies in the sport world. And if there is not a driving need for that sport at that particular time, there is not a driving need for sport management companies at that time. So economic challenges, obviously, uh, effect as well. The less people that are invested in the sport industry, uh, money goes down. Um, some folks have said in the past, and it does ring true, even during recessions and economic downfalls, people will still attend the Super Bowl and the Super Bowl is always sold out. So you have that piece of it. I think the major economic challenges would really occur with athletes maybe not reaching their potential, maybe not earning what they had thought, and obviously less revenue in means less revenue for a sport management company itself. So the heavy hitters when we talk about sport management companies and marketing agencies in the sport industry, the ones you've all heard about, the ones that ring true, that represent a majority of our professional athletes um, across the board at IMG, Octagon and Wasserman. Those three carry heavy, heavy weights across the United States. There are several other agencies out there, I mean a, a list, probably 20 to 50 of them that would do a variety of different things, have a different level of athlete database, and different level of client services. And again, I don't want to emphasize heavily on the athlete because these companies also work with organizations, they work with stadiums, arenas, and major events. When we're talking about Super Bowl, there's a company that manages a Super Bowl party outside the Fan Fest. Those are all managed by companies. <clears throat> and so when we look at those pieces, we're looking at that in a whole other realm. But specifically, um, the heavy hitters that are so well known that will pop up on Google searches continually, again, is IMG, Octagon, and Wasserman. And if you look at the names associated with those, those are just a couple from each piece, um, each entity, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. So with that brings a high reputation for athletes wanting to go and gravitate towards companies who do great work, represent their athletes very, very well, and really help them in the long run. And these companies do it very well. And again, other agencies offer high-profile services. They specialize in specific sports, too. So you'll see companies who will have client bases that are specific to international soccer clubs, European soccer specifically. MMA, you'll see a lot of MMA fighters really um, managed by specific groups. And then there's boxing, there's tennis. You know, the list goes on and on of the sports that are not necessarily niche sports, but are sports where professional athletes um, and companies need management to them. And you'll find a variety of agencies that do that. And here we have a learning activity for you to really um, get some research in 
on your own and it's conduct an online search for the highest paid athlete male and female and um, the following sports categories and tennis basketball MMA and golf and as you look at the names that come up for tennis basketball MMA and golf those are just samples and things I want you to take a look at because they're they're not necessarily all you know traditional football baseball basketball I threw some in that you can see the margins male and female and then who represents those athletes because they all have an agent a management company and then see if you can find what the percentage is for the agent to put in their pocket let's say off of the salary or yearly base of revenue for an athlete at times you'll see two percent to four percent sometimes you'll see higher but you really want to take a peek at what those support management and agents are making with those athletes so that you can see what this market looks like on this particular piece and it's very intriguing so take a peek and learn a little bit there so specifically when we talk about sport marketing we're going to shift gears a little bit um, in your text and as we really push into sport marketing it is different than sport management and marketing for an athlete so sport marketing in general I want to talk about marketing plans because marketing plans for a franchise an entity a team a uh, building which would be a venue stadium an arena that is what we're talking about on a marketing plan and that's a comprehensive strategic and tactical framework and I want you to pay attention to the fact that marketing plans often shape the business plan so when let's say a new arena gets built a marketing plan will be one of the first things that gets produced from the management side from a marketing plan you can build the business plan around it because it has outcomes it has goals it has outreach efforts and in that mix what is looked at heavily is product and it's really a tangible good service or an intangible quality that satisfies consumers wants or needs so that's what we're describing a product as so you analyze that we talk about price it's the value of the product what is the price the consumer is going to pay for your product and then place um, distribution channels how do they access it location is key on where you're going to um, advertise um, the distribution model and then promotion public relations community relations activities publicity advertising all, all in there um, really is to persuade and motivate the consumer to purchase your product when we see promotions happening at events stadiums and arenas when we see the halftime show at the Laker game those are promotions that will help in the marketing of your team franchise whatever it is and pieces that are thrown out into the audience that you go home with that stays with you you have it on your counter you look at it all day every day and it sparks something in you to try to find the next game catch it on TV it helps to really lock in the fan base so um, that is an idea of what marketing plans do and marketing really is a complex function this is not something taken lightly and sport marketing really it even has its own major so sport marketing is something where people really learn a lot about in order to benefit um, a, a company a sport franchise um, and sport marketing really is the ability to market the product to market your team your player whatever it is and to really uh, promote it and to enhance the fan base and ultimately to drive your revenue and the unique characteristics of sport it really demands a unique approach to marketing it provides marketer with challenges and opportunities those opportunities are boundless with sport because it's unique and it's different sport is ever-changing it is active um, you never know the outcome it's unpredictable and all of those pieces make sport exciting and fun and it makes sport marketing even more intriguing when we talk about branding that can happen in a lot of ways and branding can be um, any 
piece of sport you'd like to brand, which could be clothing, apparel, the athlete, a, a team, a, a venue. And branding brings about awareness. It captures an image. You want to have equity in it and then loyalty to that brand. Um, the example you see is, an, is a runner. Um, and when we think of you know the, the fastest man alive, we think of the Olympics and the 50-yard dash. Uh, Hussein Bolt comes to mind as someone who is always top of mind for us and a runner whom, when we think of the name, we think of the fastest man alive. And in his country, <clears throat> he is a very big celebrity on billboards. His brand awareness is massive and huge. His revenue from that is also proving to be uh, really a very big revenue stream for him. Now, how long will it last? Nobody knows. He's at the height of his career at the moment and no end in sight for him. And you think of folks on the United States side when it comes to running and track. Back in even the 80s, you see Carl Lewis and other runners who still have a name recognition to them, all because of the branding that goes on around the talent and the skill that earned them that right. And one of the biggest things we see in branding, and I can give you an example of sneakers for basketball players, for instance, Sneakers is a way to brand an athlete and a specifically a basketball player in getting them um, a shoe deal. People will wear their shoes. Their name is all over the shoe. And uh, kids who never even knew Michael Jordan, never even saw him play, still want to buy Air Jordans. He still sells sneakers and apparel. His logo is all over Nike gear. And that's the ultimate example of branding, especially in the sport industry. And Michael Jordan's name and his brand continues on well after his playing is over. And he's still invested in the sport of basketball, but in a completely different manner. So branding is critical. If it's done right, it can be a lifelong benefit. The learning activity here is uh, on the Internet. I really want you to dig into how are international sport entities different than those in the U.S.? Because what marketing strategies are different? And give examples of what you find when it comes to international sport versus those in the U.S. Marketing is quite different for either of those. And give us some examples of what you find, what you discover. How would you market to, an, um, let's say, a Spanish soccer club in Spain versus how would you market to an American basketball NBA team here in Los Angeles. How would you market to Barcelona, Spain, Los Angeles, California, two different sports, international, cross the board, sport is sport, but there's differences in the marketing pieces. So find out what you can, learn a little bit about that, and have fun with it. When we talk about social media, really... It's, it's powerful. Social media has a power that we can't even describe at this moment because social media really has taken on a life of its own. And I want to look at um, campaigns within social media, how powerful social media campaigns are. Can they make or break someone, an athlete, a sport company, um, an arena? Uh, whether it's true or false, in social media, the train can start running before you can stop it and correct it. We see that in the news now where we see news stories that aren't necessarily validated that hit the media streamline and we hear stories, we get a full gulp of what's happening in the world right here and right now only to find out a few minutes or a few hours later that that wasn't entirely true and or not true at all. So with social media, same concept. It's media. And what campaigns are out there that you can think of that in the world of sport haven't necessarily turned out to be true and or stretched the story and or something that's really intriguing that social media took a twist on um, and you would have never known besides the social media campaign that came about. So the learning activity here is research on social media, a sport marketing campaign that that happened 
and discuss the results. Um, did it work? Did it not work? How many shares did they have? Um, comments on it. Did it increase revenue for the team, for the athlete? What occurred that made it unique? But finding a marketing campaign for a sport something, uh, let me know what you find. It's interesting and an intriguing activity and goes to show you the power of social media.